came out of the Navy. Uh -huh. I went to work for Bryan Air Force Base. And yeah. I worked out there until it closed. Mm -hmm. And I joined the Air Force Reserve. And there's my discharge from the Air Force Reserve. Stayed in there about eight, eight, nine years. Right. And then that's when I was in the Navy. That's my discharge from the Navy. That's the USS Corregidor there. That's me when I was younger. Right. And those two gentlemen just the other side are my two brothers. I see. Both put 20 years in the Army. Senior Master Sergeant. Right. This is you here? That's me. Uh-huh. Can't tell no more. It's, it's when I was about 19. I know. It looks just like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But Herschel, the one next to me there, he's passed away uh -huh. with uh, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. I see. He was a double dipper. He, he put 20 in the Army, and then he went to Kelly Air Force Base, and he put another 20 there. I'll be darned. And then didn't get to enjoy it. It's about two or three years after that he took that Lou Gehrig's disease. And oh. Aubrey, the next one there, uh -huh. he is in Pennsylvania. He's uh, right outside of New Cumberland Army Depot. Right. Still gets to go in and get his groceries and stuff, you know. Yeah. Free. And I had one other brother that was in there, uh, one at Rockdale that, that uh, makes uh, fiddles. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, he, he was in the Air Force. For uh -huh. Yeah. But I had about, well, about four years in the, in the Navy and about eight in this. In the and Air I would still stay in it. Uh -huh. I would have stayed in because they gave me when I went to work for Air Brown Air Force Base. They gave me the same rate almost that I had in the Navy. I was first class machinist. In the Navy. I see. Yeah. And uh, but they moved me to Minot, North Dakota. I was going to have to go up there to do my two week tour, uh -huh. and I said I ain't going. I'm just get out. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. Oh, sit down. That's great. Okay. okay. I talk. I'm a big talker. Well, good. I like that. I like that. Am I in your chair no, here? Sir. Okay. 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 Yeah, I want to hear the. I'll just tell you the. I just want to hear your story. Now, now how long did you spend in the Navy? Well, I went in in, in November 1942. Right. And I came out in March 1946. Okay. And I had 33 months sea duty. You know, that's. Uh huh. Was the requirement. Right. And uh, I was on the USS Corregidor. Right. I see that. That's a carrier. And that is a, a copy of my my uh, uh, plank owner certificate. Mm -hmm. And I still, you know, with some of the guys in there, Bennett, he and I write, this is, he, he still writes it on USS Corregidor stuff. I'll be darned. And uh, they have a, at Lexington, the Lexington down at Corpus, they have a, a spot in there for the USS Corregidor and got some stuff off of it in there. Okay. Yeah, well, I've been I've been on the leg several it, times. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a nice one. Better better than that Corregidor. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I, I, every time I go down there. Matter of fact, we were just I was uh, when I talked to you yesterday. I was down in uh, Port Aransas. Were you? Yeah, and uh, that's where we were yesterday. And I didn't get I didn't go to the Lex this time, but I've been several times. I had the history of of, of my ship. The Corregidor? Mm -hmm. The Corregidor, but I can't find it in these CDE papers. I, I must have either loaned it to somebody or I've misplaced it. <clears throat> but the two ships that we sail with most of the time, the Liscombe Bay uh -huh. and the Coral Sea, I have both of their histories here together, and they tell you pretty well you know, where we were all the time together. Right. And begin with, I joined the Navy. I grew up in Bremont, Texas, uh -huh. born in Cossie. Right. Only distinction there, Bob Wills was born at Cossie, too. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, I, I played football at Bremont, and Bremont was a very small school, you know. I don't think there was over, oh, I, I've got the graduation thing, but there wasn't many in my high school. In mm -hmm. fact, when I played football for Bremont, I had to be linebacker on defense and fullback on offense. Uh -huh. So you had to play <laughs> both ways, so you, sure. you know. And, uh, of course, them days, that was in 42. 41, I was a senior in high school. And I graduated in May of 42. Uh-huh. And uh, I, I started school when I was six years old. So when I got out, I was still 16. Right. And from May to July, I turned 17 in July, July the 31st. Uh-huh. And uh, by then, they started to ration pretty good. And uh, Brian, they were building the uh, we called it the Japanese prison camp. When they were building it, they thought it was for the Japanese at Hearn. Mm -hmm. So I got me a job, a job, and I went back and forth down there for a while. And uh, it was it was kind of crude. We rode in an old uh, flatbed truck with a canvas over the top, right. and paid them I think fifty or seventy-five cents a day to, to ride. And uh, I worked on it until November, and I decided and. 
course, I, I was trying to get going anyway. I had two or three real good friends that had joined the service and was gone. So it left me kind of by myself, and I, I just really wanted to, to get in there. My mom and my daddy, no way. You wait till you're 18. You know, this was a, this was the thing. So I finally got mad at them. You know, of course, I shouldn't have ever did it, but went to Dallas, and I wrote them a letter back and sent the papers and told them to sign them and get them back to me, or that was it. Uh, you know, I said, I'm joining the Navy. Right. I'm waiting on the papers. Daddy went ahead and signed them. They sent them back. And I went, I joined the Navy in, in uh, Dallas and rode my first troop train to San Diego, uh -huh. Dallas. And I wasn't 17, and uh, Mom and Daddy, uh, I, I know they had to see me go because the war was going on, you know. Right, sure. But it was the best thing for me because some of my friends that uh, waited and, and was drafted had a real good friend, Dan Scott McCall, Jr. Uh, them days there was a wholesale grocery at Bremont that was ran, ran by Jim McCall and Dan McCall. They sold wholesale groceries. And Dan Jr. was my good friend. Mm -hmm. He got killed in the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. And if I'd have waited, I might have been there, you know. Mm -hmm. I got into San Diego, and I wanted to be a radio man. You know, I, I just, that was my thing. Man, you get to work on radios, and you get to talk on the radio. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> as usual, they pick you for something else. You know? Right. So they gave me group-free schools, and it was machinist made school. Uh -huh. And uh, I could work pretty good with my hands, but they taught me more. The group three schools in the Navy, they teach you better than anybody else, I believe. They had some of the best instructors I've ever seen. Wow. Uh, what we did, they took a, a piece of uh, uh, cast iron that was still had the casting on the outside of it, you know, rough. Mm -hmm. And they told you that you was going to cut that down to where it would be one, or it'd be yeah, one by two by four. And you do that without using a micrometer. You knew, you, nothing but a straight edge, you know, and using the, 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 the uh, well, the side of a roof. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do. And if you don't know how to use a file, you know, to, and most people, you know, go like this with a file or a hacksaw, either one. All right. They start that thing and they tell you, if you're going to get it smooth, you've got to go straight. And you got to pick it up and go straight. They taught me how to use a file, they taught me how to use a hammer, <laughs> they taught me how to use a hacksaw. Uh -huh. And when I got through, I had mine down to where, you know, it was within thing. And they, they took micrometers and me measured it. Uh -huh. And then they said, we want you to bevel the edge, you know, after you're through with it. They did, and I, I was in the top, uh, we had 400 and something in that school. Yeah. I, went, I was assigned to, I was company 42, 747. The 747th company that went through in 42. Mm -hmm. So it's because November, so he was close to the end of the year. All right. Got in that school, and I did well in the school. So when I came out, out of, I think I was in the top 40. But they gave me a little red stripe called Fireman's. That was the same in those days as a third class petty officer. Mm -hmm. I was proud, man. It made me feel good, you know. Sure. Signed me to a new ship, brand new ship. And, uh, they sent me to Bremerton, Washington, and uh, the ship was the USS Corregidor. It was, uh, I think, the fourth one that Kaiser built. And they called it just exactly what you see right here on that front page there. Mm -hmm. In that picture? Yeah. It says floating coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the one plane uh, had, I mean, one of those that they had converted, it wasn't one that Kaiser built from, from the ground up. Right. It capsized you know, on its trial run, you know. Uh -huh. But the Liscom Bay and the Corregidor and the Coral Sea was all built right together. Yeah. All three of them. And they were, they were 56, 57, and 58. Right. We were the 58. Right. And uh, we trained with some of those same guys. The guys on Liscom Bay, I knew a bunch of them. And what a lot of people don't know is that Liscom Bay lost more men than any ship in World War II except the Arizona. Uh huh. They lost 644, and some say over 700. Wow. And we got into this thing on the first trip that we went out. We took, well, we got the ship in, in uh, Astoria, and, and I was a plank owner. You know, if you're a regional crew, that's, that's what you are. They, you, you're one, one encumbered, <laughs> title to one encumbered plank in the flight day. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, picked up the flight crew down at Oakland, did shakedown on the West Coast, 
everything went well, really well. And went to Pearl and had Liberty, and we went down then to help at Tarawa. Macon, Little Macon and Tarawa were the three islands in that Marshall Gil Gilbert group, and we took Macon pretty quick. And Tarawa was a bitch. Mm -hmm. They killed more of us, and man, it was terrible. And uh, after Tarawa then, I think they got, we got scared. But not scared. I think they thought all these guys are brand new. Uh, maybe we ought to send them back, you know, and let them go home and then come back. They sunk the Liscom Bay at Trawa mm -hmm. and did it in the early morning. I was, of course, I, then I still had the fireman's stripe. I would have, when you first go aboard, and this was my initiation, <laughs> I thought I was good, you know, man. I went aboard that ship in Estuary, Oregon, and there's an old chief sitting on a bank of a valve over at the end of that thing, and I went down, made the mistake, went down the engine room in my, my, my dress blues. Uh -huh. We just mustered. He looked at me, everybody else had on their dungarees. He said, son, I said, go upstairs. And they didn't say upstairs, he said, go back up to your bunk and get you some clean skivvies and, and uh, some clean uh, dungarees and put them on. They, they don't have to be real clean, but they were, you know, I hadn't even never used them. And come back. Well, I looked at him kind of funny. That, you know, that, in the Navy, you think, well, what the heck's wrong with that damn guy? So I go back and I come back, put on my, what he didn't like was I come in the dress blues. I knew that. He came down, he says, the sailor said, we got a little problem here. He said, the ship just came down from Bremerton and said, we're here in Astoria and said, what do you do when you buy a new car? One of the first things you do. Well, I hadn't ever bought a new car. I said, I don't know. He said, well, I said, you drain the oil and change oil in it. He said, this ship is, came down that, that river brand new and said, in that, in that crank case is going to be Babbitt, you know, all over everything in there. He said, we're going to get it out. Uh -huh. So take that floor plate up and you're about six bolts and floor plate. The underneath that they had a great big plate that had screws and bolts, about 18 of them around it. He said, take all that up. And he said, you might as well take the clothes off and get out and it because you're going to be wet with sweat before you, it was hot, you know. Uh -huh. He said, you're going to be wet with sweat by the time you get started. I think, God dang, you sure picking on me. So uh -huh. I got down there, and took that plate off and got the thing, he handed me a drop light and a bunch of rags and a bucket, a little bucket. Well, right in the corner of that engine sump tank, there was a little indentation about like this. Well, you dip that oil out of it, you get every bit of the oil out of it. Okay. Then he says, crawl up under that engine and wipe that thing down with them rags and take it all out, bring it all out here. He said, I want every bit of it wiped down. Well, I was living in Skittish. We had Skinner Uniflow engines that made in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They had five pistons in a row, like a, like a diesel. Wasn't like the old ships, you know, you had a big piston, a little piston, and intermediate piston. And uh, the, uh, they had a 29 inch stroke, and it was had a 30 inches diameter in the pistons. Uh -huh. And a uh, big engine. But I crawled up under there and I did it. And when I came back out, he said, now I said, go top side, get your shower and put your clothes back on and come back down here. When I come back, I said, what else could he think of, you know, and then you do? Sitting on that thing with his cap turned about half size. Oh, he'd been there a long time. And that was his first new ship, too. Uh -huh. I got a brand new ship, and I just came in the Navy, and he was getting a brand new ship, you know, after. He said, now the next thing I want you to do, says, you see that line over there? And he pointed this little thing about that big round in the corner. He said, I want you to tell me, before you leave here today, Tell me what's in it, how much pressure's on it, which way it's going, and where to cut it off at. And I thought, God dang. <laughs> and I think I said, you're not, he said, everybody in here is going to know it. He said, every man that works in here is going to know just exactly that. And said, not only that line, but every line in here. I thought, I didn't work. but what it was, if you work in there and you take a hit, somebody's, everybody got to know. Because right. you may not be the one, just one person knows. Right. And cutting them things off when you get hit is right. important. Right. So I took it for what it's worth. But you know, he, he never did. Every time I was up for promotion, he recommended me. Yeah. 
and uh, stayed on that one. <laughs> we went, Great story. Yeah, he went yeah. down to we went down to Toronto, and I saw the Lisbon Bay sunk. Lisbon Bay was just like our ship. It was in the early morning, about uh, well, what we were doing. Uh, in between times, now, when we first went down there, we had some pretty good duty. They, we ran what they call sub patrol, and they, the Navy had a thing that looked like a, a, a torpedo, but it wasn't a torpedo. It was a what they call a fido. It, it's first times they used them, I guess. And we sent in planes up, and they dropped three buoys, and anything that came between them three buoys would alert the, the ship, and they'd go see what it was. If it was a submarine or whatever. And they'd drop them fidos from them planes just like you would a, a torpedo, and that thing was set there, and when that ship came by, it set it off, and it was run on compressed air. And then propellers would go, and if it missed it, when it ran out of compressed air, it went to the bottom. I never seen anything like it in my life. You know, I said they'd hold a pair of pliers out in front of it and move it back and forth, and you see the rudder yeah. turn. Yeah, and uh, we were doing that, and I thought, man, that's great, you know. But when we went to Chihuahua, they making was easy, little making was too. But uh, and we secured it before they got on Chihuahua. But boy, man, they they pounded that island. I don't know how many bombs they dropped on it. We dropped bombs, and uh, it. At four, about that after four o'clock one morning, what we did was, and before daylight, on the baby flat tops, because we didn't have, at that time, we didn't have night fighters. Our people flew in daytime. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd uh, pipe all the gas up, gas all the planes up, pull all the ammo up and put it on the planes, and pull all the bombs up and put them on there. See, when you landed at night, and or in the evening when you came in, they put all that back down in the ship and drained those airplanes of the, of the fuel. Mm -hmm. Well, they caught us when we were fueling up and moving bombs. And most, well, the worst time, you know, that you could be in. Sure. And that one torpedo, and they fired two, I think, but one torpedo hit that ship, and 20 minutes later, it was on the bottom. I never seen anything go down that fast. My, I was, uh, like I say, when you, you don't get a good, real good duty, I was in what they call a repair unit. Mm -hmm. If you get a hole inside the ship, you're supposed to stick a mattress in it. <laughs> that was it. Mm -hmm. But I crawled up the uptakes, me and Paul Argo, and we looked out under the uptakes at that ship because we knew it got hit. We knew it was hit. And they might have they might have really got on us. They knew we pulled out from our, our station. But I watched that. I could not believe that a ship that big, we could see guys running up and down that flight deck with it listing bad and trying to break out holes. And it didn't have any water. You know, they lost all the power. Mm -hmm. And that gasoline and the bombs exploded too. It kept exploding, but the gasoline uh, burnt what, where they were piping it up. You know, on the hangar deck, the whole thing. I never seen anything that was made out of steel. Of course, that flight deck wasn't made out of steel. Mm -hmm. I never seen anything burn that way that quick. How far away were you from this? Were you? Well, it could have been about. I'd say about three, four miles. Mm -hmm. See, they ran them ships together, and then they'd pull a cruiser that had uh, radar on it. We didn't have radar on, on the carriers, in, them little ones, didn't we? And we didn't have real good planes. We had F-4Fs. That was mm -hmm. the, the Grumman, From Grumman Model T. It was what, what right. we'd have Model T for. Exactly. Yeah. The predecessor of the F-6F. F-6F yeah. was a good plane. Exactly. F-4F, F it was, a, it was worst, the worst landing gear of any ship I've ever seen. Yeah. And when, if they bounced too heavy on that flight deck, it, it collapsed. Right. And it couldn't outmaneuver the no, zero no. either. Zero just fly yeah. rings around. Fly rings, yeah, yeah, that's why they. I we, know a little something about the F six F because <laughs> my 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 mother's first husband uh, actually was killed uh, on a training exercise on the F six F on the Hellcat. That, that Hellcat, yeah. it looked a lot like that Wildcat, but it was bigger yeah. and heavier. Right. And that rascal would fly. I mean to tell you, oh, even yeah. if it had holes in the engine. Yeah. It would I collect models of F6Fs, as Do a you? matter of fact. But yeah, and pictures and everything. I get my the kill ratio on that on that F6F was about 20 to 1. Mm -hmm. That was a good plane. Oh yeah, yeah, and it was made during the war. I mean, yeah. it was it was. Yeah, it, yeah. They, they 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 needed a better airplane, that, so Grumman well, made them a better airplane while the war was going on. The old SVDs and uh, uh -huh. those others, they you know they they were slow and yeah, they, they were just it couldn't hang it exactly. But exactly. that plane good. But F4Fs were, were what were mainly on the... Yeah, that was what we had. Yeah. 
And uh, anyway, we, we came back. The Wildcat, yeah. Yeah, the Wildcat was first. Right. Wildcat and, was the F4F. Right? Yeah. yeah. Sounded like a T model Ford. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we, we came back to Pearl and come back to the States. And uh, I think they did it because of Liscombe Bay and because of, we had so much trouble with Toronto. Because that's the first trip we made. It was down and back, you know. Uh -huh. And when we got back to, uh, to San Diego, they gave us a uh, 14-day leave. And I got on the plane, got me a plane ticket, and got on the plane to come to Dallas. And in Phoenix, Arizona, they had some uh, uh, some guys that were, uh, well, had a higher priority. In them days, you had to have priority on the plane even. Mm -hmm. These were cadets, and they were, they were going home. Well, they kicked me and another old guy off and told us to get a plane the next morning and took those guys aboard. So we didn't mind too much. We partied on the town. The next morning they called us. They paid for our hotel room and everything, you know. Next morning they called us to, to go and I uh, go back to, you know, get on a plane. And I checked and I had everything but my leave papers. Uh oh. And of course, you know, them old jumpers, you know, you just, we'd always fold them and stick them down like this and pull the jumper down over it. I couldn't figure out what in the world happened. And it scared me because I knew I still had to go through a checkpoint in Dallas, you know getting off that airplane. <laughs> I knew darn well it going to be an MP standing there wanting to see some papers probably. Right. So I told that guy was with me. I said, you still got your papers? He said, yeah. So I said, I'm going to rent a typewriter. And I went and got me a typewriter. And I typed up this full set of papers. Oh, my goodness. And I signed Captain Roscoe L. Bowman's name <laughs> to, to the bottom of it. And he looked authentic uh -huh. because I had a copy to go by, you know. Right. <laughs> I stuck them things in my pocket. And he said, you going to? I said, yeah. I said, I ain't got nothing else. I got, I'm going to do it. I got off that plane in Dallas and I was scared. And I caught that old inner urban that used to run from Dallas to Waco. Right. You know, because I figured there wouldn't be many people in the highway to come from Waco to Bremont. Uh -huh. Three days after I was home on leave, I slept in a little late. I think I might have honky tonked or something that night. Mama came in and woke me up and said, Gene said, the postmaster is here and he wants to see you. So I got up and <clears throat> Alfred Clark was a postmaster and he had been a friend. I went to school with his daughter and and uh, been a friend for years and full of fun. You know, he looked at me and said, Gene said, uh, they called me and said that you're AWOL. I said, Mr. Clark, I ain't AWOL. I said, I didn't want to show him the leave papers. I said, I'm not, I got to leave till a certain day. You know, I'm supposed to go back. He said, do you have some leave papers? <laughs> I told him the truth. I said, Mr. Clark, I lost my dad's leave papers. He said, well, I'm going to tell you something. Somebody found them. A good Samaritan mm -hmm. picked them up on the streets of Phoenix, Arizona, mm -hmm. and mailed them, air mail, uh -huh. to the postmaster at Carwell, Texas, uh -huh. and asked me to bring them to you. Uh -huh. So I went back. I didn't have to worry about the you know, papers. And it always bothered me because it's the only thing I ever forged in my life. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I was, at, I was intent on getting home. Yeah. Went back, and we picked up. So the AWOL, he was just no. messing with. Oh yeah. He, okay. That, yeah. See, he was he was getting a big big he bang. Would, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He because he knew he knew your real papers. He, he had them, right. That's the reason I want to see him. You want to see if I'm showing them, them the fake papers. ones. <laughs> <laughs> and we we picked up in in Dago to go back to the war, and uh, they and this is one of the funniest things that ever happened. And I know I can't tell it on the air, but I'm going to tell you. Okay. They lashed down every plane that they could get on the top flight deck. We wasn't fly, didn't have room to fly off of it even. Mm -hmm. Carried a big load of them back. And they put about 1,500, while I had them elevators up, 1,500 soldiers on the hangar deck in cots. And they even put them down in them elevator pits. You know, and they had a space underneath them, you know, where all that stuff goes up. And if you've ever been in the Navy, you know how they are about the damn restrooms. Mm -hmm. They have everything that they got to shut it down and clean it up with a toothbrush. You know, they want it fixed up to where it is clean. Well, them soldiers, it, it, just, that just, it just overloaded the whole system. And they wouldn't leave them restrooms open for about two hours, mm -hmm. and you had to stand in line to get yeah. in it. Yeah. You know, it was bad. Yeah. And uh, what happened, and I, I can understand the protest, some guy in, in the after elevator pit shit and then took a, the guy's blanket right there and wiped his butt on it. Uh -huh. And when that guy came back and saw it, he told the captain. Yeah. 
and he lined every damn one of them soldiers up at attention on that on hanging deck and asked them, point blank, did you do that? Not a darn one of them would admit to it. You can't blame them, but they didn't. Right. And when they got into Pearl, we all got liberty. They, they told us to, you know, take off. He kept every one of them on there and hauled, called uh, trucks and stuff, and he hauled them straight to another base. He wouldn't even give them liberty off that ship. Wow. And, uh, but that was, they even made up poems. Your Aunt Navy is about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so the men, I remember part of it, I, 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 I heard it several times, like, all of them, you know, it was a big joke for a long time. Right. Uh, the men stood at attention, <laughs> and the captain threw a fit. <laughs> Who was the bird that dropped the turd in the after elevator pit? <laughs> that's, that's part of it. <laughs> that's great. It was something. Uh, <laughs> anyway, from there we went. We went four major battles. Yeah. We went down to. Uh, we went to Annie we took. We went to Kawajna. We, Kawajna was the biggest lagoon in the world, mm -hmm. and we were there to help secure it. The, the, the Japanese had been there for a long time, and they had it, uh, had it pretty well. It's, incidentally, we've got men on Kawajna now. It's still, in fact, one of the guys that worked for me, Ted, Ted, uh, oh, you think his last name, but Deputy, mm -hmm. worked for me here. Mm -hmm. He and his wife went out there, and she's making big money as a nurse, and he's, he's just, he told me he was just, uh, work in the beach. I've been there. <laughs> Galloway, Ted Galloway, uh -huh. he worked for me. But his wife was a registered nurse, yeah. and I guess they needed, you know, one out there. But that's where we dropped those atomic bombs, if you remember. <clears throat> but it's cleared out to where they got people coming back in there. Mm -hmm. We went to Anyweetuk and Kwajalein with two landings on New Guinea, and uh, went to, and we ended up Guam, Saipan, and Kenya mm -hmm. before we came back. And uh, lots of things happened in between. We the worst battle I guess we was in was in Saipan. Right. It was it was pretty rough. Yeah. And uh, with the ship uh, lost, uh, these ships were bad about busting uh, piston rings. Mm -hmm. The way that thing worked, see, they had superheated stream, steam that uh, was introduced into those pistons with the check valves. You know, each one of them almost like a diesel. They were timed. And that superheated steam went through those those things, and it was hot, man. It, it was really hot. And when it came out, then you had to condense that steam back into water. And they ran it through some filters that were made out of diatomaceous earth and asbestos fiber. They they coated them uh, screens with that those two things, and then they pushed that uh, steam through there, and the oil that was in that steam came off on those those screens that were coated with that. Then you. Uh, shut it down and pulled the screen and scraped it all off mm -hmm. and washed it up again and recoated it and put it back on it. It was pretty good. It filtered it out. Mm -hmm. But it was it was a when you when you the lowest man on the totem pole, your duty was to clean them filters. Right. <laughs> and the only time I ever got really sick, seasick, I was on duty. Uh, it was my time to clean those filters. And I clean them. You put it in a bucket and take it top side. If it's out at sea, you throw it over the fantail. Mm -hmm. Can't do nothing like that in port, you know, but you can right. do it out there. Right. And uh, I finally got to where I'd, I'd leave a little room in the top for me to vomit in. Mm -hmm. We had had some pork chops. Mm -hmm. They were greasy as they could be, and they had <clears throat> not pumped the bilge like they ought to, and had the sloshing, you know, and then the day was rough. And I'd sit there and it'd roll a little bit, and I'd watch that water slosh, and I'd clean that old stinking oil off them, with that diatomaceous earth off them filters. That was the only time I really felt sick, but I did. I felt like seasick that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the, we, we were, the other thing I can remember, we went to uh, New Maine, New Caledonia, and uh, pulled into the port and stopped. And they told us, well, it's hot, man, it was hot down through there. And incidentally, we crossed the equator on the Corregidor. And then I crossed the equator and, and the date line almost at the same time. I'm in dark. The, uh, they give you what they call a, an award for that. I'll show you. I think I do. What it looks like. The, the date line, the, well, crossing the, the uh, I don't have a whole lot of pictures. This is 
M division on the corregidor, and that's me standing right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are pictures from Hawaii. Bought pictures. Right. We couldn't, couldn't hardly. And this is initiation on the thing. These guys on that on that flat deck of that carrier when you cross the equator, uh -huh. they, they, they do that, uh, initiate you into the. Uh, well, it's. Uh, Are you in that picture? I'm not in this one. Yeah. Okay. This, this, these were guys that were the royal judges. I see. They pro oh, I see. pronounced the, the sentence, you know. Uh huh. And here was the royal dentist. That guy was sitting there. He's fixing to vomit. He's getting up from where the dentist. They squirt. I don't know. It looks like oil and quinine or something. In uh huh. Mouth. Uh huh. And uh, this is the royal baby, and that's his bottle sitting there. You crawl, uh -huh. crawl up there, and he always offers you a drink out of his bottle. Uh huh. And you can't, you can't stand it. It's bad. If you don't do it, then they shock you. And these damn things like this, they have them wired. You know. Yeah. Knock you down almost, almost like a, like a what you call it. And chelates. And here's one where they dump them back into. They build a. A trough like this and fill it with water. Right. And it gets you up here and it cuts your hair uh -huh. and, or run it if you've got it. And then flip you over backwards. See, they're flipping that and backwards in there. And then they try to drown you when you get in there. Oh, man. It was, it was rough. <laughs> and here was a chute and they, they put garbage in that thing from one end to the other. And you got to start in on this end to crawl through that chute. And they shoot that doggone hose in this end and throws that garbage right up in your face. Oh, my gosh. It's been, they were rough. <laughs> And here, this is the, the three you get. The Golden Dragon, this was on the Oglethorpe. Uh -huh. And that's uh, within 10 degrees, crossing them both. Uh -huh. It's supposed to be the, the date line and the, the you know, uh, oh, Neptune's Rex thing. Right. Imperial domain of the Green Dragon. Green Dragon. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's Neptune's Rex. <coughs> this is the domain of Dep Neptune's Rex. This was on in November of 43, uh -huh. and this one here was close to it. But this one here, I didn't cross that date line until 45. I see. But this one, we got them both almost at the same time. Golden Dragon. I'll be darned. And the wow. issue is these little things like this tell you what you can wear. You know, yeah. as far as the, your, this one on the Oglethorpe, it said it four, four battles on that one, it says. Uh-huh. And uh, you better have it with you if you've got the medals on. Right. And the captain, they, they sign it. And uh, that was amazing. Here's me walking down the street with a boy from from Bremont, only one I saw all the time I was out there. Yeah. His name's Mac Man. That's me there. Uh -huh. it's, 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 we're in Honolulu. It's Denny. I wasn't quite GI. The pants were too long. And I, uh -huh. I was second class then. Uh huh. Got to be first class after that. And these are some of the things. This was a commissioning ceremony for the Oglethorpe. Right. I got two brand new ships, which is unusual. Wow. Anyway, after we came back from from uh, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian, uh -huh. we uh, they gave they put we pulled into uh, that's that's it, the same boy. Uh huh. And there's where we got discharged from down close to Houston. Right. And here, the first time I came home, American Airlines gave me this when we flew over the the highest part of Texas, Wink, out at Wink. Uh huh. It's supposed to be the highest right. Highest point. Holt, a guy named Holt was the and Hostetter. I'll be darned. There were, there were two that were there. And this is a few of the things I kept. A lot of the things are, you know, we lost and got got gone. Yeah. And on the Oglethorpe, and I picked it up when I came off of Now you were at the Og on the Oglethorpe after the Yes. Okay. When I after came, Corregidor? After Corregidor. When we came from Guam, Saipan, and Tinian, mm -hmm. uh, a whole bunch of us had been on there a, a pretty good while. Uh, and they didn't have any room for any chief petty officers. See, I was first class and the mm -hmm. chiefs were still on there. Mm -hmm. And in order to give you a chance to advance, they'd give you new, new construction. And they gave a whole bunch of us new construction. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't know what I was going to get. I wish I could have stayed on, on the Corregidor. They gave me an AKA. And here's what an AKA looks like. It's called a KA-100. Right. Landing craft. See the booms? Yeah. And those attack cargo, that's what they call it. And I made first class on, on that thing, and we went through the Panama Canal. I see. I got off the, the Corregidor in in uh, 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 Pearl Harbor, uh -huh. and they, they told me a whole bunch of them were flying back. They, they give you 
uh, you can get a flight, you know, from uh, Air Force if you could find room. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't let you carry your, your whole bedding. You could carry a sea bag, but you couldn't carry that, you know, that hammock. Mm -hmm. you, and mattress and all that, you couldn't carry. It's too much, you know, too much weight. So I, I threw mine away, got on that rascal, and flew back and landed in uh, uh, Oakland, California. And they put me out on that, uh, I believe it was Treasure Island. It's a little island out there close to Alcaraz. Right. And uh, they told me, said, uh, asked me where my bone was. And I said, you're supposed to carry that stuff everywhere you go when you're moving. They told me, I had 14 days leave and, and, and uh, report back to uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Come across the United States. And I thought, well, man. So I had to sleep on, <laughs> on a bunk without any bedding for a while. Mm -hmm. And it was really uncomfortable. I did it one night, took my pea coat and put it under there and step on them springs. But next night, a bunch of guys come through and said, y'all want to run shore patrol for a little while? I said, we, we've got a, a place for you where you can get a bunk. And I asked him about my leave. I said, well, it, it has no effect you leave. He said, we can make it to where you still get the full 14 days. Well, for about two weeks, this is the first time I ever had anything to do with, with law enforcement. They put one regular MP and one petty officer that was first class with him to patrol. Mm -hmm. And we worked from 10th and Broadway to 14th and Broadway in Oakland, California. And it was during the time that Mr. Burns, who was the, uh, had been the uh, Secretary of State, they had the Burns curfew law. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you ever heard of it or not, but one o'clock you had to be off the street. All servicemen in those towns had to be off the street. We th pulled sailors and soldiers out of them during bars at one. They closed the bar, but they'd go to sleep or, you know, wouldn't be off, off the street. And pick them up and call the regular shore patrol and they'd, they'd pick them up. Sometimes if they were sober, we'd try to let them go. But if they were drunk, you know, we'd get them off the street. Okay. And I didn't, I didn't like it at all, but it never did get in a fight. But we had a lot of them show get mad at you, you know. And uh, at the end of that two week, I came on and went home and then went to, to uh, Norfolk. And they, uh, first they put me over in, uh, on Pier 92 in New York City. Mm -hmm. And President Roosevelt died while I was on Pier, in Pier 92 in New York City. And I marched down on, on, on the Army Day Parade that year I marched down Fifth Avenue with a Navy group off of Pier 92. Pier 92 was right next to where the old iron size was mm -hmm. uh, tied up. Right. And they always, everybody said it was a ground on coffee grounds. You know, right. Uh -huh. in there but it was there. Yeah. Cold, man, I'm telling you, out of the water on a pier, you know, uh, you, you can't hardly get warm. Right. And I wanted to get away from there as quick as I could. So they, my ship wasn't ready. Uh, they signed to that USS Oglethorpe, you're still on the ways. Uh -huh. They hadn't even launched it. So they pushed me down to, to New Jersey, Kearney, New Jersey. And some of the best duty that I had, man, it was nice. People were nice to us. And it was in kind of like a, a YMCA building that had been converted into a you know barracks uh -huh. in town. No guards, no nothing. They issued us badges just like the guys wore out at the, out at the uh, shipyard. And it was Federal Shipbuilding Dry Dock Company. And uh, in Kearney, the one thing I remember big, well, of course, was Pat Duffy's Rose Room that all the sailors went to. And we had a ball. It, it, was, it was really, I spent every bit of the money that I saved that <laughs> almost going, you know, while I was at sea, mm -hmm. you know, on that other ship. I, I kept sending them, Mama called Mama to tell her to send me some money. And uh, because I just, you know, I was just, just having the time. Right. And the, the, the thing lasted too long. We finally launched it. And what I did, and the duty that I had was, you go to the ship every morning and muster. Now, at night, you you know, you were on your own and you went to the, to the barracks to mm -hmm. sleep. But you had to be accounted for in the morning at work thing. And you report to, I report to a civilian and I find out what they were going to install that day or what they had completed. And I made cards, uh, the manufacturer, the serial number, and where you order parts from for every piece of machinery that there was in the engine room. That was my job. Mm -hmm. And after I got you know, caught up, well, I'd just go ask the, 
the guys that were in, the civilians that were in charge of putting that stuff in, y'all putting anything in today? And they said, no, we got, we won't get nothing else in today. Uh, but you threw them, you know, for the whole day. Well, it was too much liberty for me. It just, mm -hmm. you know, and anyway, we finally launched it and I came out of it and we went down the west coast, uh, east coast, and went through the Panama Canal. And halfway between the Panama Canal and Pearl, the war ended. Mm -hmm. They dropped the bomb. But I still had to go down on that ship. We went out and picked up surplus. Right. And brought it back. Brought, to, well, things that had never been un 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 unpacked. Wow. Brand new equipment. Yeah. And at uh, New Maya, New Caledonia, where we'd been before, I saw them push good, good equipment into the drink mm -hmm. because they didn't want to haul it. Right. It wasn't wore out. It was, it was good, yeah. but they didn't want the free French to have it. I don't know why. Right. But but we didn't. Uh huh. It, that's, that was the last trip that I was on. When I came yeah. back then, I got out. Yeah. Talk about the, you talk about Saipan. Yeah. Was the roughest battle that you were yeah. in. What? Well, what Tarawa and Saipan, they, right. they, they uh, I don't have any, I, I think we shot down about 16 planes, but all we got caught, baby flat tops got caught in a, you know, thing that they didn't think you were going to be put into. Uh -huh. And as uh, the corregidor, is that what you corregidor? Refer, corregidor, is that what you refer to as a baby flat top? Baby flat tops, which means it's not as large as Kaiser's floating coffins. Okay. Or postage stamp carriers, right. jeep carriers. Uh huh. Okay. And some of them people, uh, would, would, well, I have them tell me this two or three times, maybe mad. That them little things that Kaiser built. They wasn't supposed to be in no battle. They just supposed to transfer planes from one place to the other. Uh -huh. That was that's a dang lie. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, the, the baby flat top. It, well, the corregidor was six hundred and something feet long, about right. about the length of a football field. Right. And uh, uh, they had about eighteen and eighteen, about thirty six planes. About eighteen bombers and eighteen fighters. That's about all they could handle. That, that's about the, the mm -hmm. squadron, it's somewhere in that neighborhood. And uh, but the best pilots that I ever saw were on baby flat tops. Right, they were good. Yeah, especially those that they when they got around to flying at night. We got night fighters before we got off there. Corsair came along and they had a little trouble with it. They were going wings, go wings, and they couldn't see the deck as well as they could on them other planes. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Camp Loose, when I was in Group Three schools. Uh, I saw the first, for the first time, I saw P-38. They had about four or five of them outside of San Diego that we'd see. We'd be standing in line on the grinder waiting for lunch or something. And I saw, and this is the only time I ever ever seen an uh, accident. They were playing like follow the leader. And it was amazing to all of us because a P-38 could come down like this and he could stand it on his nose and it could fly straight up. As the first plane I ever seen that I thought could fly straight up. But they were doing that, and one guy came up under the other one and cut the tail off. And it was over the marine uh, 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 grinder. Mm -hmm. And one, one of them survived and the other one didn't. And that plane comes straight back down. But it, it looked like it stayed in the air for, you know, how, how you just kind of freeze something? Yeah. And you see one of them get out, but the one that got out that we saw, I don't believe his shoe there open. It looked just like a string behind him. I think that's what killed him. Mm -hmm. But uh, that thing crashed, and it was over government property. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was just, well, I was just flabbergasted. I yeah. couldn't believe that that rascal could fly like that. Wow. It goes straight up. Yeah. Beautiful thing. Right. Did you ever come in contact by chance with the USS Princeton? You remember that? Don't remember oh, no. seeing okay. the Princeton. Okay. Coral Sea, Liskin Bay, and Coral, and uh, oh, after that it was Gambier Bay, kind of filled in for Liskin Bay after it was sunk. Uh -huh. And uh, we had the Big Potato, Idaho, they, right. it, it was there with us. Right. And uh, yeah. several cruisers, and we had one can that came along. We refueled every now and then. The, a can would fuel a tin can sometime off of a carrier. Yeah. Called the Kid. Right. If I remember, it had a picture of a Captain Kid on the, on the stack. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we, we had we had some real experiences with that in, in the weather. What so when you got when, when you when you were finished when you got when when were you uh, discharged? In March of '46. And then what'd you do? 
<laughs> well, I've had about four or five careers. <laughs> yeah, I know you're, you're Burleson County Sheriff, right? Yeah, I, I, what I did, I, I went to work for George Holland, the dealer, the Ford dealer in Bremont, Texas. <clears throat> uh-huh. And uh, I, I was a member of the 5220 Club. You know what 5220 Club is? No. Well, the government paid uh, an employer 52 weeks, $20 a week, to, to employ somebody and teach them a trade. Uh -huh. And it was it was good. George Holland taught me how to keep books. He was a Ford dealer at Bremont. Uh -huh. And he needed, needed a bookkeeper, he needed a bookkeeper parts man. He paid me $20 and the government paid me $20 for 52 weeks. Well, George got a good deal and I got a good deal. Right, okay. And uh, <clears throat> George told me when I went to work, he said, Gene said, I ain't gonna be here a long time. He said, <clears throat> my daughter, <clears throat> I don't have no sons, and said, this will probably be your place someday. So you probably can buy this Ford dealership. And I went went to work, you know, thinking maybe I might. Uh -huh. George Allen had a daughter named Betty Jean that married a Mexican movie star. And the, the, she met him at the University of Texas. Educated, good looking, but he couldn't speak English without a brogue. And uh, in Mexico, he was real successful. Betty Jean and he had two young men, two kids, and Betty finally got enough of it. She told me, said, every place you go, you got a bodyguard. Said, mm -hmm. You know, said, you, you can't trust nobody. And said, I just can't live like that no more. So she come up back and, and moved in with George, daddy, mm -hmm. and her daddy. We waited about, and George came to me in about one morning, about uh, three weeks after that, and he said, Gene, I don't know. <laughs> said, I've got a little problem. I said, what is it? He said, George has come over here and said, we got to find a place for him to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says and he can't do very much of anything. He said uh, uh, he can't be a salesman. He said I couldn't put him out selling. He said, tell you what I'll do. He said you can start selling for me. If you'll teach him the books, I'll let him be the bookkeeper and parts man. Mm -hmm. Come in, and he was he was sharp and a good looking man, nice man. And I taught him the books best I could, but I had to change, and it ruined me and George both. He could not read writing. It had to be printed, uh -huh. you know. And so while we started printing all the tickets and you know printing everything, and it worked. Yeah. But I got to where I print half the time and write half the time. It just ruined me for the rest of my life. <laughs> but uh, uh, he came to work, and George wasn't getting but four cars a month. Got three cars and pickup because it was the end of the war, and you know it was yeah. working. And he could sell them all himself. Uh -huh. You know, he just didn't have no trouble. People were trying to give him money under the counter to, to get the cars in those days. And so finally one day I told him, I said, Mr. George, I'm, I, I appreciate you know all you've done for me, and, but I'm going to look for something else. So Ray Harvey sent me word to come down here. You know, he wanted to talk to me. Mm -hmm. he, some of them salesmen that come around, they, they knew I was going to move. And uh, I didn't really come down here right then. I went to Marlin and uh, I went to work for Ferris Doyle Pontiac as the assistant manager. Mm -hmm. Worked there one year, and Tommy Tommy Ferris was an alcoholic, and I didn't know it. He'd had uh, oh, uh, vodka in the parts bins, mm -hmm. you know, and ended up he, what he didn't tend to business. So I said, well, I'm gonna get away from here. And uh, so that time I came and talked to Mr. Harvey, and Woodham had been here, and Woodham told me, so you don't want to go to work for Ray. He said, he won't say you that business. So I tried to buy him. <laughs> but Woodham was in uh, auto sales in, in uh, uh, Cameron or Rockdale up there somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I came on anyway, and I worked for Mr. Ray for three years. And the best job I ever had, I bought this house, you know, when, whenever I was working for him. Mm -hmm. He gave me an automobile to drive, gave me uh, all the gas I wanted, and uh, uh, gave me Two hundred and fifty dollars a month, and uh, three percent of the net income of the, business, the whole business, mm -hmm. and he, we made money. He couldn't break himself from the old ways. So I, uh, when I worked at Fresh Oil Pontiac, I learned to, to sell cars. I really learned how to sell cars. Mm -hmm. I sold fifteen, sixteen cars a month back in them days, and we'd go buy a car to sell it. Mm -hmm. You know, if we we find one, we'd go somewhere and get a car to sell. Uh -huh. Ray wouldn't do that. He wouldn't do it at all. And so after the third year, I uh, I walked into Woodson Lumber Company one day, and Perkins was sitting there. And I said, Mr. Perkins, you need to pick up today? He said, no, I don't. He said, I don't know. I said, 
Yeah, I said, I said, what, what do you want for a pickup? I said, tell you what, I just take one to drive. You know, I'm going to drive it myself. I said, I got one sitting here, I'll save you for $1,750 just right now. He said, $1,750 for that pickup sitting there? I said, yes, sir. And uh, he said, I'll tell you what, I want back. So I handed him the key. Mm -hmm. And I went on back and drew up the papers and everything, carried them up there and gave them to him. He sent me a note when we got through. He says, uh, wouldn't you like to go to work for Woodson? I said, man, I don't know nothing about lumber. Well, Mr. Yaney had been uh, had had a heart attack, and he was the manager in 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 uh, Bryan. He said, "Well, Mr. Mr. Yaney may not be able to go back to work." He said, "We need somebody good in Bryan." He said, "I like the way you do. You know the the, the way you sell things." He said, "You you know what you're doing." He said, uh, "Why don't you come to work for us? You can work here to." I said, "Told him I said I can't figure lumber. I don't know nothing about lumber. Mm -hmm. I worked for here for for Perkins and Yeager and them." In fact, Jaeger and I were real good friends. I did his funeral the other day when he died. He was one of the owners and went to work for him. And uh, they kept me here three months and I went over there to Bryan. I have never been in a place where you just, you didn't have time to do nothing. Mm -hmm. That phone was ringing off the hook. They had more business than they could handle. Right. And they were, they'd haul, they'd have a train would sit, that's when it's down on, the, on that uh, corner down there train would send you two boxcar loads of lumber and you'd have to go up there to workforce people and get people to come unload it. You know, that was one of the things you had to do. And then the, the one thing that if they could have did it any different, I might have stayed. The prices that they quoted people to get the job, you know, when they, they bid on sheetrock, mm -hmm. lumber, two to fours, whatever, they were never the same on one thing. So every day you had to go back to that bid to find out how to price out the sheets. Mm -hmm. And it was a job, man, I worked my tail off. Yeah. And finally, Vic Barnett, he was, a, uh, he knew, knew me when I worked for Ray here. He came to me and said, ain't you about ready to go back to work? So Mr. Cade needs a man in Bryan, <laughs> I mean in Caldwell, at the Ford House here. So mm -hmm. I came back to the Ford House in Caldwell and worked till I went to work for the post office. Mm -hmm. But I worked from the po post office till 1985 uh -huh. and I, I was, uh, Lucky enough, I, I worked for the union. I uh, was a, I'm past president of the Texas Rural Letter Carriers, uh -huh. past state steward. I used to fly to, to Memphis to try to keep the guy from getting fired after he, or getting put back. And sometimes I did and sometimes I didn't. Uh -huh. If they were sorry and didn't, didn't do what they were supposed to do, I didn't work too hard. You hear what I'm talking about? Yeah. We had blacks. We started hiring blacks then in Houston and Beaumont. Some of them would go off and leave the mail in the car sitting and just go on home. He was sitting on the road mm -hmm. and then expect you to get them put back to work. You know, way. You, you got responsibility when you're carrying that mail. You know, you let that postmaster know what's going on. If you can't get the mail right. delivered, you, he's got to get somebody. Right. And it was interesting. I had a black man up there that negotiated with me sometime. And every now and then we'd have a place where uh, the sex got in the way, you know, of, of the business. Uh -huh. And uh, he told me one time, and I'll never forget the way he said it, he said, said Mr. Gene said, one thing you want to remember, said, don't dip your pen in the company ink. <laughs> <laughs> don't, dip, don't dip your pen. <laughs> uh. <laughs> he was a good one. So were you a, were you a carrier? Or you, or I was you, a rural carrier. Yeah, I see. I got my appointment, uh, yeah. it was back in the days when uh, postmasters and rural carriers were appointed by, by Congress by the uh, people that's in Congress. Yeah. Homer Thornberry was the man that recommended me to be the real carrier here. All right, all right. And, uh, so you uh, did that till 85? I did, I did that till 85. Uh -huh. And I had been uh, a police officer, well, since 73. And while I was on the school board, I was on the school board 20 something years. All right. And while I was on the school board, I worked all the football <clears throat> games. And we didn't have no problems because I had two strokes on them. I was also the on the school board and, and a police officer too. Uh -huh. And uh, worked out good. We, we worked all the football games and uh, uh, and city appreciated it because we were reserves, but they never did classify me as reserve. I took all the courses that they're supposed to take, you know, and, and passed all of them. Right. And uh, I believe in getting educated. In fact, I was one of the first bunch, me and my wife, my wife was too, that they sent from Texas A&M over here mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, start off educating the officers. 
The first guy I worked for was, was uh, Ed Smith, and Ed had never been to school, and uh, he went to that school, he and his wife both did. Mm -hmm. What he did though, he, he told me, he said, and this is part of the things I'm going to say at Lynn College one day next week, I'm going over to make a little speech for them when she retires here. Mm -hmm. He get, says, Gene said, oh, you got a gun and a badge, and he said, I'll back you in anything that you, you do, I, even though you may be wrong. He said, but, uh, in public, he said, I'm going to back you. He said, I may not ask we get away from there, he said, but I'm going to be on your side. He said, one thing I want you to know is this, don't ever, don't you ever unarrest anybody. He said, once you make up your mind that he needs to go to jail and you're going to arrest him, said you fight him all the way to that jail. Mm -hmm. He said, don't you ever change your mind. <laughs> and I remember that. Yeah. And you don't. It's the worst thing you can do. Right. You know, if he if you told him once he's under arrest, you better make make sure he, he needed to be. Exactly. And it was like that. If you, you don't want arrest nobody. And then he, he meant for you if you if you had to fight him all the way, you fight him all the way to the jail. Mm-hmm. And but he spit tobacco juice all over the side of that car and when we would relieve him he'd have to go wash the car before he could go go to patrol it. <laughs> yeah. But I had fun being in the uh, thing too. Yeah. I came at a time we had Mr. Urbanowski. I ran against him. Right. I I had made up my mind that I was gonna gonna run and then Wilhelm told me that, that uh, he was gonna retire. And I went ahead and announced, and then he announced, you know, and he really wanted his chief deputy, I think, to have a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would not vote for the, the, the commissioners wouldn't, mm -hmm. for the chief deputy. And uh, as a replacement for William. And I think it, it, it kind of got to him, and I know it, it got to the chief deputy. And they ended up, they wouldn't appoint me. And uh, they appointed a, a guy that really shouldn't have ever been appointed, Mr. Urbanowski. Mm -hmm. And he got in trouble, and he really embarrassed the whole county. We, mm -hmm. People were talking about us everywhere, mm -hmm. you know, about what was going on at the sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. So finally, Charlie Sebesta and, uh, and the uh, Rangers came in, and uh, the things that he was doing, they carried to the grand jury, and the grand jury sealed the indictment, and he stepped, he stepped down. Mm -hmm. you know. But then they had to appoint somebody, mm -hmm. and they ended up appointing me to fill out the expired term. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made sure the first two or three things I did when I first day I went out there, I told them I said, "Well, I don't know what went on, and I don't really care. But I'm tell you this: I'm not going to fire anybody right now, and I, because I don't know, you know, how you've been performing." And uh, We'll just play from here. Everybody come back to work tomorrow. We'll do it just the way you've been doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, little by little, I found out what happened, you know, because I couldn't get it from, from the other people. Mm -hmm. In the jail, we changed out a lot of people, and there was some that we let go from, from the front part. And after we got those in, we changed to, to, to looking at people for their quality of work rather than whether they're good looking or. Mm -hmm. uh, the former sheriff, Mr. Urbanowski, told Ranger Kaufman that these girls do anything I want them to do. So I'm the sheriff. He had one there he called Bambi. He said, come over here, Bambi. You need to give her a big old kiss right in front of the, front of the ranger. Well, you don't make friends with that kind of crap. Uh -huh. And then they'd take off and go to, out to uh, Las Vegas and that, that kind of thing. And it was, it was out all over town, you know. Uh -huh. This didn't, didn't. I told him at first, won't be any, two things. We'll have Christmas parties, we'll have birthday parties, things like that. There won't be no alcohol. And if you drink alcohol and you come on, on and I call you, come out, you know, don't come if you're drink, drinking it because if, they, if people smell it on your breath, you're drunk. Mm -hmm. If you try to rest a drunk, you're drunker than he is. Mm -hmm. And it gets you in trouble and me in trouble, and I ain't going to have that. Right. And I never had that problem. Yeah. Never did. Yeah. And the other thing I told them is their, your reputation is just like mine. Right. The worst man out here is what they judge you, judge us by. Yeah. And what you do affects me. And I want you to know it. Don't go to them joints when you get off. If you want to drink a beer, go home. Get you some barbecue and drink your beer. But don't get out there and fraternize with people you may have to pick up tomorrow. Right. 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 Mm -hmm.
So you were sheriff from when to when? I, uh, I was a little over 10 years. I had two full full times. Nobody ran against me, but it was two times. Uh -huh. And it was we're lucky because uh, uh, I was a Democrat, and the Republicans were coming on strong, you know. Right. Uh -huh. And in fact, they they made some inroads into the county now. Sure. But the guy that, ref that but I never did let that part bother me. Right. And uh, I hired several Republicans that I knew. Dale was a Republican when I hired him. Uh, lots of them that I hired. I never ask you ask people who yeah. did you vote for. That's right. I want to know if you're going to do a good job for me. Exactly. And. Yeah. Uh, uh, Integrity is something you, you have to build and you have to make people know that you, you stand for it. Dr. Joe Smith, it, you know, does all the, the uh, things up there on the He sent me a hundred dollars when I was running and said, I like that word that you use, integrity. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I pulled the county out of, out of a good good thing. We, we came on and uh, uh, got respect back. People respected us. And uh, we treated people like they're supposed to be treated, yeah. and uh, we were successful. We felt real good about you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, what's your wife's name? Doris. And how long have y'all been married? We got married uh, the sixth and thirteenth of forty-six. Uh huh. Soon be sixty. Yeah. Well, it's already sixty. Yeah, yeah. It'll be sixty-one. Coming up. Y'all have kids? Yep. We celebrated our our fiftieth real big. The kids helped us out. We had. Right. At the high school. Yeah. Had everybody come. She was so, so sick at 60, we didn't do it. Right. Uh, I've got uh, my son in law, Johnny, is married to Jeannie Price. Uh huh. Johnny Price is the uh, uh, street superintendent for the city. Uh huh. Jeannie is the Mad Hatter. My daughter is the Mad Hatter. She got, she's a RN and works at Scott and White. Uh huh. Uh, and then comes back and runs her little, it, she's got a, well, uh, it's a boutique. Women buy clothes and gifts and uh -huh. everything in there, and she also serves best soup and salad and, and uh, sandwiches you can find. Here in Caldwell. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. And then my, my son lives across the street from me. He bought uh, Burn Andrews' old house. Uh -huh. He's a welder, and uh, he built a big shop in the back of his house there the other day. He's working out of mineral wells right now and got the best job he's ever had. He uh, is, is a state certified welder. He went to, to Brenham and uh, he learned a whole lot of welding, aluminum welding, from a, a shop there in, in, in uh, Brenham. Mm -hmm. But he's got his own truck and he buys his own equipment, you know, everything. And he's on call 24 hours a day for a big oil company. They send him into Oklahoma and uh, well, Tyler, all over North Texas, give him 80 bucks an hour. Wow. But wow. he furnishes of it, everything. Yeah. There's, you know, all the settling and all that thing. All right. And he has to go any time. Sure. You know. Yeah. He come back and when he built that shop and he tried to work out here. They give him 40 bucks an hour, but they couldn't keep him busy. Uh-huh. Up there, you know, they got they yeah. places for him to go. So you got a daughter and a son? Is that all? son. That's all. Got grandkids. How many grandkids? Uh, I got, let's see. Jeannie has uh, two, uh -huh. and Dexter has one. So you got three grandkids. I got my, my one grandkid. I got great grandkids. Wow. Uh, my grandkids are having grandkids. Yeah. I got one grandson that uh, works for the Robertson County EMTs right now. Uh huh. And he's been to fire school. <coughs> he wants to get on in, in Bryner College Station as a fireman. Mm -hmm. And he has his application in over there, but. He's working on the ambulance now in Robertson County. I see. He's not married. Yeah. Lives, lives in Bryan. Uh huh. Name is Thomas too. Uh huh. I think he kind of goes along with uh, his grandpa's name. Right. We got three Thomases. I'm Th Thomas. And uh huh. My son's Thomas. He's right. I'm Thomas Eugene. Everybody yeah. calls me Gene. And Dexter, my son over there, we call him Dexter, but he's Thomas Dexter. I see. I, I, see. I, I named him Thomas Dexter. I thought maybe he'd use TD. And people were thinking means touchdown. Uh, it didn't work. <laughs> oh man, what a great, great, great story! What a great career! Let me see your your, your book here. What what else have you got over hey, there? In, in the book here, the uh, this one's about. Well, I'd like to I'd like to borrow. Is this the long book that you were? That yeah. was the long book. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to borrow this and give it back to you tomorrow. You can. You can? I want uh, just want to scan some uh, some pictures. That 
is beer drinking. Oh, where was that taken? San Diego. And which one are you? Right here? That's me, right here. Right here, okay, yeah. <laughs> San Diego. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to show you this. Some good pictures. Here I am in the Navy. I've got this picture here somewhere. That's mm -hmm. the picture that stayed in the post office the whole time that I was. Right. Was in the Navy. And this is Herschel. This is my brother that his book's in here, and Aubrey, the other one, uh -huh. this is one that's dead. Right. But Herschel and I are both in this Robinson County Veterans book. Uh huh. But that's me right there. I'll be darned. Time changes things. <laughs> but that one stayed in the, you know, used to they put your picture in the post office if you were in the Navy uh -huh. or Army or whatever. Yeah. All the veterans, all the people who were gone that was in the, and that, that's the one right there that stayed in the, in the, the one that put Wow. In the, I've got that big one, but I don't know where I've got it. I've lost them. I misplaced them, I think. Uh, they ain't much in them. You can take this one if you want to, but I don't know where you can blow that thing up or one where you need me. Yeah, I could, I could, I could, yeah, I can make that. I can okay. just can. I just want to... Where I was getting some of those those things, for instance... Well, that's at the USS Pearl Harbor. There was this picture, downtown Pearl Harbor. Uh-huh. The lower towers on, on there, and so is uh, uh, what? But two? I can't remember the end of two. Is this like Diamond Head or? I work? think that maybe Diamond Head. Yeah. They had several things. You know, they had the upside down waterfalls. Right. That they wanted everybody to see. And in, in Hawaii, them kids learned to swim, and they're water boats as soon as they're born. Almost. Uh huh. And. Uh, there was one place I know it had to be in the movie. So waterfalls that fell into a uh, crater that looked like an old volcano mm -hmm. up on the side of one of those mountains. Yeah. And that stream came all the way down through Hawaii, down through uh, Honolulu. And them little kids would jump off of that thing, down there, it had to be 50, 60 feet high, into that bottomless uh, uh, thing. Right. This thing here that came out of, let's go got a lot of good dates in it and it oh good he was talking about how long before Corregidor when it fell uh-huh Corregidor lasted a long time right they started it said here the siege of Corregidor started in let's see what could have been Corregidor siege begins it was six, January the 2nd through the 7th of 42 that's where the siege began. Uh huh. And it was May before it fell. Up here, Baton, Philippines. Here, Corregidor. May is 56. That's how long it lasted. Wow. Yeah. That thing has got good dates in it. I, I couldn't have. Sure it up. Up. Everybody was proud of the Corregidor. You know the people who served on that time. Right. A lot of, a lot the of Corregidor things. was is an island, and uh, it's, a, it's called the Rock. Well, you the know, Rock, yeah. It was a, a fortress that they they made into a well, they even had a, a train track in it. They could back guns in and put them in there. Mm -hmm. Wainwright and and uh, uh, Douglas MacArthur split up. That's where he left him. He right. Left Wainwright in charge and, and uh, had that. Dug out, dug. I, I will return, or I shall return. Thing. That's where we're starting. Mm -hmm. I downloaded this off my Google the other day. All the ships that were at Pearl. Yeah. And even the this one gives us all the Japanese. Right. And how many flourish? How many times they come across? Here. Yeah. Google does pretty good. On so you were in four, four battles. Four major battles. Four major battles. And. Uh, and those were uh, Saipan, Guam, Saipan, Guam. Kenyan. That was one group. Uh -huh. Marshall Gilbert group. Right. Chihuahua, Little Macon, and, and, and any week, any we took in that group. Okay. And on that, if I find that thing tomorrow, I'm, I'm gonna look some more for it. Yeah. The history of the Corregidor. It's just like the history of that coral sea over there. Right. And it, the pictures with it. What I did, I went out to the high school. If I remember. Uh huh. And. Uh, I want a good picture of the Corregidor. Can I borrow this? You bet. Just take it down. You need that one. Yeah. And then, uh, 
That's a similar picture to the one that's in the. Uh, yeah, it's somewhat like. That's in your. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. That's a good. Yeah. These are pretty much the same yeah, vintage, aren't they? Yeah. That that was I was younger than that. One. This in this one here? Yeah. That was younger. I was younger. Yeah, that one you were younger. Yeah. Yeah, that's a more cl clearer picture, though. Here's a. These are the. Uh, your medal, your your, and you know, also my two military. Uh huh. One for the navy, one for the air. Force. So those the medals of your four about. Yes. Yeah. One's a good kind. Yeah. Can this come off? Yeah. It's I, can, I can. I can scan. Put it straight out. Okay. Because I can scan that. Oh, it's yeah. nailed on. I need it. Because I can scan that and give that back to you tomorrow. That's I don't good. want to take everything off. Yeah. This will be here, good. Here's something. Uh huh. They, they gave us when we were carrying our. Okay, I put, resealed it again. Right. To, when we when we were discharged. Yeah, and uh, it was it was wearing off on the corner, so I had it resealed. Oh, I see. Twenty seventh November forty two, twenty second March forty six. Honorable, and you, you yeah, thing, and your fingerprint was on it, right? And signature, right? That proved that you were you were you, you did it. Yeah. Well, this is great. This is great. Can I borrow your restroom? You have a restroom in here? Go right on in. Gene Barber has lived in Caldwell since the early fifties. Used to be the sheriff in those parts. But before that, he served in World War II on the Corregidor. It's quite a story. A story that started when he was quite young. Too young, according to his parents. That's true. I went to Dallas, Texas and sent the papers back home to Mom and Dad and asked them if they wouldn't sign them and send them up there. My dad thought I was too young, thought I ought to wait till I was 18, you know, like the rest of the guys. But I didn't. They sent them back and uh, my first troop train trip was from uh, Dallas, Texas to San Diego. Yeah, 17 years old on that troop train, he was a little bit wide-eyed. It was a long way from his hometown of Bremond. It really, really is, and no one went in with me from my hometown. That was the thing. I was by myself, mm -hmm. and the only person that I really got acquainted with was Kilroy. Every place I went, he'd done been there. Now, because he did sign up, Gene Barber had his choice somewhat of where he wanted to go. Did not want to go to Europe. The Battle of the Bulge was raging there. Instead, he went to the Pacific. That's true. Mm -hmm. my, my best friend was a little bit older than I, and he joined, he, he was waited till he was drafted, and then he was in the Battle of the Bulge and lost his life there. Uh, Dan Scott McCall Jr. was one of the best friends that I had in high school, played football together, and Dan went to, uh, uh, you know, to Europe. I went to the Navy. I chose the Navy because I thought I'd learned something in the Navy, and I did. Gene Barber had served some eight years in the Air Force Reserve, but he learned his trade, a machinist, in the Navy. Well, in November of 1942, the war had been going on since December of 41, and I was lucky in boot camp, uh, the, the four camps in San Diego are right together. It's Camp Decatur, and Camp Luce, and Camp Mahan, and Camp, Far camp Farragut. Mm -hmm. And uh, you go to Decatur for the, for the boot camp, and when you get out of boot camp, then if you get a school, you may stay in the same uh, area. And I was lucky. I got group three schools in San Diego, California, and they taught me how to use a, a hammer and a, a hacksaw and a file and hand tools. And they also gave us some time on the lathe, mini machine, and shaper. And I applied myself. I, I finally decided that maybe I needed to, you know, bear down and do things like you ought to do. Exactly. And uh, they gave me a fireman first rate out of uh, group three schools and assigned me my first assignment it new construction out of Astoria, Oregon, and that's where we picked up the Corregidor. The Corregidor, also called a baby flat top, could hold 18 bombers and 18 fighters. The reason why I, I give them credit for teaching me discipline, uh, when I first went aboard the, the, the carrier, uh, I was a member of the original crew, which they, they, they call you a plank owner plank owner in the flight deck of the ship that you're assigned to. Well, I am a plank owner in the USS Corregidor. I picked up the ship. They brought it down from Vancouver, down the, uh, down the river to uh, Astoria and, uh, and Seaside, two little places there on, uh, in Oregon. And we uh, came aboard the first day, and you always muster on the flight deck. Well, I mustered on the flight deck in my blues, and I went down to the engine room in my blues. And an old chief that was there was sitting on a bank of valves 
and he called me over because he saw I was different from the others and I had my blues on. And he gave me my first assignment. Yeah, Gene Barber calls him a tough old bird. You'll find out about that first assignment and more of the service of Gene Barber from Caldwell. I'm Tom Turpaville. This is Bravo Brazos Valley. Brought to you by Me Santa Associates. They that do justice neat. to Bob Wills. And we oh, hope, I'm familiar with them. <laughs> we hope you'll come and enjoy uh, a little trip down memory lane. Good. And thank night. you for sharing your memories with us. This is wonderful. <laughs> this is really wonderful. It was indeed a thrill for Gene Barber, and he will enjoy the show. And remember, you can enjoy the show, too. It's the MSC Opus presentation coming up February the 1st and the 2nd, a ride with Bob Wills with Asleep at the Wheel and Ray Benson. I'm Tom Turpaville. Thank you for your service, Gene Barber. This is Bravo Brazos Valley. And they take off about daylight because we didn't have people that uh, flew at night, not right. on baby flat tops. And had right. F4Fs and, and the F4Fs and TBM, like the president has out at the, uh, out at the museum, it was one, one of the planes that we had on there. Mm -hmm. Those were two, TBMs and TBF. One mm -hmm. was just made in a different place from the other, but they were both just alike. And we, we gave them ground support every morning, fly them off and bring them back. And it's a beautiful thing to watch. If you've ever uh, been to sea on a carrier, the way that they take off and the way that they land. And they uh -huh. land, when they take off, they're loaded. And on a baby flat top, you had to steam into the wind. You know, right. you had to turn it into the wind because they didn't go fast enough. 19 knots, right. if there wasn't any wind, it was hard for them to get altitude. And sometimes they'd go in the drink when they'd go off the front of the ship. They'd go down like this and then pull, pull up, you know. Best pilots in the world were on those carriers. Uh, it, it, if you could land on one of those things, you could land on anything. Anyway, the, we'd fly them in and they would uh, come back and get another load and go. And they bombed Turawawa forever. And the big ships that were there, that, like the, I believe the Big Potato was there, Utah and some of those, they shelled that island forever. There wasn't anything left hardly standing, but they were dug in to where when the Marines went in there, we had terrible losses. It was terrible, you know, the men that we lost. Lost more men there than ever. There was one event of the war that Gene Barber will never forget. It was watching the sinking of the USS Liscombe Bay. One morning when we were doing all this, uh, getting ready to go bomb, and they were piping up the oil, uh, the, well, I mean the uh, fuel, and bringing up the bombs to load the planes to send them off. The USS Liscombe Bay was steaming about 220 yards off of our, uh, I believe it was a starboard bow. We were all three right together. And the Jap a Japanese sub submarine launched a torpedo that hit about three quarters way back on, on the, the uh, USS Liscombe Bay. And I never had any idea. We, we knew what was going on. Went to, we were at quarters already. We were at general quarters because we were getting ready like everybody else. And when we heard the, the commotion and heard what was going on, I was uh, stationed then, of course, you just, I just had, still had my red stripe. It was my first trip down at a repair station. Me and Paul Argo, another guy, we pulled up and went up the uh, uh, uptakes. Mm -hmm. Uptakes on a ship is where the air circulates back up. They pump air down into the ship and then it goes back up and out the side. We went through the uptakes and we watched as the Liscombe Bay was sinking. Terrible, terrible thing. They couldn't even get water to put, you know, on the, on the fire. The gasoline that they were putting in the airplanes ignited on a hangar deck and the whole ship from one end to the other was burning and red hot. And it sank stern first. It went down with the back, back end going down first. And they lost over 600 men in about 20 minutes. Tomorrow we'll finish up with Gene Barber from Caldwell, one of the biggest Bob Wills fans you'll ever see. I'm Tom Turpaville. This is Bravo Brazos Valley, brought to you by Me San Associates.